back to Psychedelic Today, a weekly podcast exploring the science and culture of the psychedelic field with your hosts, Kyle Buller and Joe Moore. So on this episode today, I get to chat with author Tom Lane. Um, Tom has a bachelor's and undergrad in forestry from the University of Tennessee and also a master's um, from the University of Florida in science education and middle school education. Um, He's worked full-time in the solar energy field as a contractor and trainer, um, and he also has this background in studying mushrooms. Uh, So Tom is the author of the book called Sacred Mushroom Rituals, uh, The Search for the Blood of Quetzalcoatl. Um, Tom spent some time back in 1973 living in the jungles of Palenque and spent some time in Oaxaca and yeah, really kind of got to know the mushrooms, learned about mushroom ceremonies down there and even got to spend some time and have a ceremony with Maria Sabina and cross paths with Gordon Watson at one point and I think exchanged some, some letters with him, um, I first was introduced to Tom at the Psychedelic Science Conference in Oakland, the MAPS Conference in 2017. Forget how we started chatting. I think he was just sitting next to me and he had his book with him and, you know, he was telling me about his his travels to Mexico and how he got involved with the mushrooms and, you know, I was kind of really interested in his story and then um, he ended up reaching back out uh, and said, hey, I remember chatting with you. <laughs> want to get you on the show and uh, learn more about your story. So yeah, glad that we were able to get him on. Um, kind of really made me realize how interdisciplinary the psychedelic field is. I mean, there's just so many angles to learning about psychedelics and it almost seems so hard to really cover all the ground and, and learn everything, you know, from history to science to the psychology, um, ethnobotany. I mean, there's just so much to the field. Um, and this is one area that, you know, I'm not too, uh, you know, knowledgeable of. Like, I know a little bit about the, um, you know, the ceremonial use of mushrooms and how they were used um, down in Mexico and, you um, but, you know, to the extent of what Tom's writing about and um, about Quetzalcoatl, you know, not too, I wasn't like I knew, familiar with Quetzalcoatl, but not too much about the background of Quetzalcoatl. And so it was really fun to listen to Tom's story and uh, yeah, just to hear about what he was up to in the, in the 70s and 80s and exploring mushrooms and also exploring this uh, ceremony that he, he came across the ceremony of the deified heart. Um, so I'm going to leave this intro a little short uh, because uh, Tom and I went a little over an hour. So and let you get right into it. But, you know, quickly, uh, make sure you're subscribed to the show, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. We greatly, greatly appreciate that. Um, also, if you like the show, leave us a review. Facebook and iTunes uh, definitely helps out. And yeah, I just want to say thanks so much for listening and tuning in and supporting Psychedelics Today. It's been an awesome journey with you all, and we wouldn't be able to do it without you. So I hope you all enjoy this episode with Tom Lane. And yeah, you know, if this uh, episode piques your interest, I'd definitely encourage you check out his book. I just grabbed the Kindle edition on Amazon and also to maybe dig in a little bit into Mazatec and Mesoamerica history and learn more about the mushrooms. It really kind of made me realize, you know, this is a place I don't know too too much about because I've just been more in the psychology realm of things. So yeah, learning about history is important and um, you know, this is where it all starts from. So getting educated about this this realm is super important. So I encourage you all to dig in and maybe um yeah, just check out what was going on back then. And yeah. All right, enough rambling on my end. Enjoy the episode and we'll catch you on the other side. All right, welcome everybody back to Psychedelics Today with your host Kyle Buller. Um, I'm here with Tom Lane, uh, author of a cool mushroom book, uh, Sacred Mushroom Rituals, The Search for the Blood of Quetzalcoatl. Welcome to the show, Tom. Excited to chat with you. Thanks. It's uh, great to be on the show. It's uh, amazing to see what's going on with the sacred mushrooms today compared to 
when I was back there in 73 and how time has changed and there seems to be like a renaissance of people wanting to know about the mushroom sort of from three standpoints, from a pharmacological standpoint and the other sort of, um, I would say maybe new age or party standpoint. And I belong to a group of people that are into like some of the ancient rituals that were called in Mesoamerica, especially the rituals that Quetzalcoatl taught to meet and become Quetzalcoatl, uh, what's called sacred ceremony of the deified heart. And uh, there's tons and tons of misinformation about Quetzalcoatl. For one thing, he was not an Aztec. He originated as a king man in the Toltec civilization thousands of years before the Aztecs. And the legend was from the female male serpent, his penis, his blood fell. Well, a lot of these legends and stuff came after Quetzalcoatl died, you know, where his blood fell the sacred mushrooms grew. But Previous to that time in Mesoamerica, uh, the indigenous people have been like really primitive people. And Quetzalcoatl brought the first idea of there's a spark of divinity in mankind, and that's connected to the heavens above and to the earth below. And it's all sacred in that we, you know, can enjoy this spark of deity in ourselves. We're not just the chaos in the world. And due to the revelations of this man, who must have been like a superman, like a combination king, uh, human, you know, Teotihuacan and the great cities were bought, and he brought all this art and culture and dance. And the main thing he did was stop human sacrifice and try to stop all the wars between tribes. And even his own people were upset to a great extent that he was giving these teachings to them. And he said, you know, this sacred knowledge is for everybody, the sacred knowledge of the mushroom and what comes forth from God is everybody. There are no chosen people. And uh, he really tried to preach uh, sacrifice and, and uh, you know, being reborn, re- being reborn on this earth, you know. Right. Uh, I want to back up a little bit and just kind of uh, introduce Quetzalcoatl. I don't know if uh, some of our listeners know who Quetzalcoatl is or a little bit of background. So could you give a little background information about who Quetzalcoatl was or is? Well, I can go back really far, but some people believe he was a Naga. I don't know if you're familiar with the Nagas, the mystical serpents of, uh, you know, mentioned a lot in Hindu and Buddhism. For instance, the Buddha was taught a lot by different Nagals. And this is just my guesstimation that Quetzalcoatl was a jeweled wing plume serpent. He was a combination of female and the ascending female feathered part and the male descending serpent, the, uh, the other part. And that was there was a combination of flow of energy between the sun and the earth. And this uh, was a jeweled wing, plume, diamond, faceted God of Mesoamerica. First, he appeared to the Toltecs and to the Mayans as Culiacan, and he had several types of followers. Uh, one were the priest and priestess. He was basically the only God that had both male and female priest and priestess in the house of Tullock, who was his faithful brother. But when you look at his other followers, there were these religious knights. Uh, They're all called Eagle Knights, but they were split into Jaguar and uh, Eagle in their dress and, 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 and their knights. They were almost like a uh, Kung Fu type of knights that practiced spiritual practices, but there were also Fierce warriors. Uh, the other was the Pocatecas, where the Pocatecas were like traveling merchants. They were followers of Quetzalcoatl. And I'm learning now from some of my friends in South America and Peru and other places, these Pocatecas went all over spreading the message of Quetzalcoatl and the use of sacred mushrooms. What was unique about them 
uh, they were dedicated followers, but they had to be do fair trade. In other words, they were always expected to do fair trade. And then when they returned from Tiwakiwakan or came back from traveling, their houses, that they were not allowed to show any real possessions or show like, you know, that they were rich people. That they had to live in a very common house. Even though they were a trader, of course, and brought back a lot of stuff for the empire, they weren't. They were expected to live a simple life. These were the three main groups. And, but if you find all over this, this is the experience. They talk about winged, jeweled, plumed, male, female serpent. And if you look at these codexes, and if you start to see the Stellas of Xochimilico, which we can talk about later, and also to see a lot of these different Stellas that are carved, it becomes pretty obvious that the use of the sacred mushroom was a form of actually meeting and becoming Quetzalcoatl. When you take the sacred mushroom, especially in the ceremony of the deified heart, Quetzalcoatl will actually appear and come to you. The jeweled wing serpent, it's just like millions of uh, diamonds all radiating colors of the rainbow. Now, there's many of the sacred mushroom ceremonies where Quetzalcoatl actually comes into. And I know a lot of people that ask Quetzalcoatl to come and swallow them in healing ceremonies, and I'm not the only person that by any means has met and encountered Quetzalcoatl. But there were some actual ceremonies to do that. There was a called the Ceremony of the Deified Heart, which is one of the ceremonies to, to actually meet and become Quetzalcoatl. Hmm. Super interesting. So how did you begin on this journey? I know you ended up uh, down in Mexico and got really involved and spent some time with Maria Sabina. So how did you end up getting involved with the sacred mushroom and just, yeah, being down in Mexico and learning about all this? Well, when I first went down there, I was building geodesic domes in a really remote area in the mountains, what they call the Switzerland of Mexico. It's called the Palpa. It's south of Guadalajara, a beautiful city, and uh, near Ciudad Guzman. Back then, Ciudad Guzman, they actually had Calvary when I was down there. And it was uh, after I would have been building domes, we took a trip, and I saw this store where the Catholics were selling uh, things for the indigenous Indians, uh, stuff like for the wheat troll and also for the out of the sacred mushroom culture, some of their uh, things that they made. I got interested in that and went to the Natural History Museum in Mexico City. Then I decided to go to into Planky and everything, and I had sort of my first experiences with what they called at that time the uh, San Isidro, or back then we called it scientifically Stropharia Cabenskis, but I know it's philosophy events us now and had some incredible experiences at a waterfall and then I actually went to the wall and didn't see Maria but Sabina I didn't know about her and then I went into the mountains of uh, San Jose del Pacifico and I lived with Zipolite uh, for quite a while and, and then I went back into the mountains of uh, San Mateo Rio Hondo and also into San Augustine La Sicha. And it was just sort of one experience with the mushrooms after another that led me to realizing uh, eventually that the story was about Quetzalcoatl. And I participated with uh, Curran Darrow in a ceremony, the ceremony of the deified heart. He was a shepherd in the fields between San Mateo Rio Hondo and, and uh, San Mateo uh, some uh, San Sebastian Rio Hondo, and um, at that time, you know, it was really strange down there. They had sort of the, the Mexican army and the federales and the Nixon and everything were sort of driving all the what you call the weirdos or the yippies or the hippies or out of Mexico. But Zipolite was a place like you could go to. It's like Barrio de Navidad, they were two sort of like hole-in-the-wall camps where the federales didn't come unless 
they were on a mission to do something, you know. Well, my first experience with the mushroom, like when it was in Palenque, it was more of a, a, a beginning, just a, a very mild sort of thing where I met this young woman who I did mushrooms with who had, it was sort of like, they always say the mushrooms find you the first time, and that's really true. My first thing, they sort of found me and were given to me in spite of my looking for them. And that's why I started to realize there was something mystical. There was something really in this that was just more than uh, commonplace when you took them as a sacrament. And the interesting thing, I've taken them with Vietnamese, Buddhist, and with a friend of mine that was a Russian midget, sort of from the Lithuania area that escaped in the Second World War and then Barnum Bailey Circus. We used to be friends down on the Swanee River, and a lot of you know, these people, if they take the mushroom in the same sort of ceremonies, they see the same religious motifs. They'll often see the sacred jaguar. They'll see Aztec priests. It's sort of there's something inherent in this world that connects what at the time was a sort of a mythical book we used to carry back in 73. It was called The Return of the Lord of the Dawn by, I think it was Tony Shira, and it was a sort of a spiritual book this Indian had written on the poems of Quetzalcoatl returning. And somehow I felt like the discovery of the mus- sacred mushrooms down there, that he was coming back, that he was returning. Hmm. It's interesting with the similar visions and imagery. I, I know Albert Hoffman describes some of that in his books, um, coming back and seeing kind of like, um, I don't know if he described it as like kind of Aztec or Mexican uh like symbols and, and textures when, when he was under the influence of psilocybin. We so. actually felt he had an Aztec priest over him with the knife and an obsidian knife. And he actually experienced the Aztec priest being over him and on top of him with a, with a obsidian knife. And I think some of the things of this are just like when you see these pyramids and you see all those motifs, you all of a sudden you start to realize they're musical. These are musical motifs. Hmm. I mean, the whole pyramid of Chichen Itza, do you know when you clap out in front of it, it makes the chirrut sound of the bird? No idea. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, when you're out in front of it and you clap your hands together, it makes the sound of the Quetzal bird. Huh. And uh, it's pretty obvious from seeing a lot of these things that this had to do with teaching a lot of people, especially about divination and healing, and especially about healing and healing their bodies, because these people don't, didn't have, you know, doctors or medical clinics like we did. And they re- really relied on this uh, this act of Quetzalcoatl of uh, bringing pure life and energy to the healing processes they had. Yeah. Why is Quetzalcoatl such a, I guess, a big figure deity in in, the, in those in that culture? Well, he is as big or bigger in that culture as Christ is in Christianity. In fact, there's a lot of tales which I don't have believe. The Mormons believe he was a, a different Christ in uh, Mesoamerica that came later. Uh, other people thought he was a monk from China. Other people thought he was St. Thomas or a uh, monk from Ireland. There's all sorts of stories because when the Spanish came up on the store, shores, it's really embarrassing to see these crosses everywhere that, that people had wanted to put something up. And I'll tell you what, Quetzalcoatl told them to put the crosses up and all these baptismal fountains. And all of these, uh, they were probably the most religious people on earth uh, to the point of the Aztecs have gone over my feeling to the point of insanity about some of their religion and, and what they believe. But, you know, all through uh, Mexico and even up into the southwest to some extent, but not anywhere near like below the Texas, Mexico border when you get into desert areas, but all through Central South America and I mean Central America and the southern parts of Mexico and all of the Horn of uh, Colombia, 
you know, Venezuela. It seemed like these polka, this uh, God Quetzalcoatl, the legend and the story spread. And it's quite common all through this region. And my feeling is it, it, the, the basic all relies on this one ceremony, the ceremony of the deified heart, which the priest and the people taught. And basically and what this ceremony is, is after you've used the mushroom a lot, you know, you've used the sacred mushroom a lot and are experienced with it. And I'll say you should use it during the day. There's especially a lot of deities during the day, especially when it's raining and in clouds, you can see it's crazy not to take it during the day because you find out how all these animals and plant, plants are all animistic and living and you can see the, the, the spirits in this world and of course it's good at night but in the sacred ceremony this is when you want to bind yourself you want Quetzalcoatl to come and I'm not saying that he doesn't come on other situations because I know he does but this is to, to actually create and have Quetzalcoatl come and you're fasted for about 18 hours before this ceremony you understand what I'm talking about Okay, you're fasted for about 18 hours, and then about two to three hours before, you take a lot of raw cocoa. You drink this raw cocoa. Do you understand what I'm saying? The drink. Not the chocolate from the store, but the ground up, the real beans, because there's two uh, Oh, they're psychomagnetic, like blessed transmitters to make you feel good. The legend was Quetzalcoatl gave it to his followers as an aphrodisiac, but he also gave it to start the sacred mushroom ceremony so you would start to feel good. You know, whatever it was, you know, you've been going in your life, maybe you were on a bummer or whatever, or a little anticipant or, and all of what was going to happen, but this made you feel good, right? It released a lot of serotonin. Yeah, raw and cacao the, is a little bit different than the chocolate that you'd buy in the store, or even like the powdered chocolate. So anybody listening, um, Tom's talking about raw cool. cacao. It's a, it comes from the beans broken down, made into a paste, or you could eat the beans. And um, yeah, well, you could buy them online. You can buy them online. Yeah, from and and grind them up in a coffee grinder. And you want to uh, do that when they're cold. That helps preserve them. And then you just. Put them in just like you would coffee. Now, some people put a little sugar in them if they don't like the taste because it's a, a little bit different taste in coffee. But I mean, I'm not talking about sugar, but I mean, a little bit of honey or maybe a drop of vanilla. But I always liked it just like it was. I never find any problem because it does a really a great rush of all that chocolate coming in. I love, I'm a chocolate so. Anytime you can get me to drink raw cacao, I'm all for it, you know? Theobromine, food of the gods, right? Um, yeah, yeah, it has actually, actually has theobromine in it, which is uh, it's like uh, caffeine, which is in coffee, but it's a lot better for you, way better. It does have some caffeine in it, but it's unbelievable antioxidants. When you look at the antioxidants in it, it'll... It'll blow your mind. Yeah, and then that that bliss uh, compound that you're talking about, about uh, ananamide, I believe, is what it's called. Yeah, called the bliss molecule. And so, um, yeah, raw yeah, cacao then, has all one, these really great benefits. So it's it's interesting. I know one, that raw cacao is part of the culture down there too. So it would be interesting if they did pair those together, raw cacao with with mushrooms. Well, you know, that was part of it. And, uh, you know, it created a sort of, they say there's a chemical PA. I think that thing that you listed, they say that's when lovers are enamored with each other, when we both think the other one's the angel, you know, before we our feet touch the ground, you know. Mm -hmm. That chemical's in there, which I think is why that was sort of an aphrodisiac. But then you... After that, one of the main things is not to talk a lot, not to talk a whole lot, but the most important thing is to gather live families of mushrooms, mushrooms that are still living, mushrooms that are you've gathered from the earth and brought in in pots and families, or you could have grown them. I did a ceremony in uh, Nevada about three weeks ago in the Goblin Valley Desert where we used ones that were grown. But the, the, the thing, of there were these were live mushrooms that are still li living that are carbohydrate and 
Maltos and they're living and they're living people. And one of the things you do before the ceremony is when you come in, I always like to put four candles, these wax candles is sort of a direction thing, a make up a direction of the four directions of the earth. But the main thing was to have some light because we would sing to the mushrooms and you just sing whatever you're feeling like. There's no song you have to sing. It's just you're thanking them for going to meet Quetzalcoatl and you're praising them for letting them be food for your body. You're, you're thanking them more than anything else that they're food, not some thing, you know, so your body can live, you know, so your body, just like bread or milk and you're being grateful. The mushrooms will actually start to dance in the dirt. I mean, it's amazing. They'll start moving and back and forth. I'm not talking about walking around, but the stipes will start moving and they'll start mo moving up and down on the stipes. But the real key to this ceremony is when you eat the mushrooms, you eat them with honey. Now, one thing, uh, Francisco Ramiti showed me that blew me away because I had gotten some American, uh, African honeybee honey. It, the Aztecs had this black bee. They had this very black bee. It looked, looked more like a wasp, smaller than a honeybee, and made combs only about half as thick, but it made the same type of honey. And we used some of that honey, and it, it, it's the same sort of honey uh, that you cover the mushrooms with. And that, to me, that bee was the key to understanding the, uh, the Anacodex, the final translation of it. But to go on, you cover the mushrooms with the honey. Completely. You understand what I'm saying? All right, then you realize these are live mushrooms and you're taking them two at a time. And you're holding them with reverence because you're thinking about this of your intent to bind yourself in the meat catsapotl. Now, what happens is these mushrooms are totally covered in honey, right? When you put them in your mouth, you never swallow. You eat, you eat, you eat, you chew, you masticate, you never swallow. Uh, the saliva in your mouth and the honey changes the maltose to glucose and all the psilocybin is converted to psilocin right in your mouth. Full conversion, 100%. And you're not going to swallow. You don't have to. The mixture of the sacrament, what the followers call the holy flowers, the holy flowers of the blood, your mucous membranes in your tongue and the roof of your mouth take it straight to the brain and straight to the spine. It goes right into your neck, goes straight to your brain and straight to your spine. The facial veins on the inside of your face, you know, the ones like if you paint your cheek, but they're on the inside. Mm -hmm. That goes straight to the ventral aorta of the heart. That's part of why they call it the ceremony of the deified heart. And so you're taking this sacred mushrooms and they're going straight into the ventral aorta of the heart and straight in the spine and you just keep eating there is no limit and to all of a sudden it'll be like you're starting to disappear and then when you quit eating there it's almost like your body just appears but you come back and in my case and i know other people's your whole spine and your back will start moving around it feels like it's a sidewinder snake in your back that's just moving all around and moving around with a real intensity. And I know a lot of my friends and people call, call it or talk, say that's a Kundalini or something like that. Okay, you call it what you want, but I'm just telling you my experience and what I'm experiencing. It. And then when you go out, Quetzalcoatl will come. Now, for most people, 99% of the time, Unless you've had some of the experiences like I have, that he will come different on the first time. But 99% of the time when he comes, this naga, this dragon, is made of unbelievable millions and millions of diamonds. And he's not like some huge monster uh, like Godzilla. I mean, he's about, you know, like human height, but he exists into eternity and I mean, you're seeing this millions and millions of diamonds, and they're all flashing out the colors of the rainbow. You know, at first when he's coming, it seems like there's all these red and blue colors coming in, and then it's like he's coming in through the void. And 
like we were there and we were in a healing ceremony, all of a sudden he arrives. And sometimes it's like if you're outside, I don't know why they call it the wind god, because there'll be so much wind, all of a sudden it might be the middle of the night, you feel like there's just a tremendous amount of wind coming from everywhere. And then he arrives. And uh, to me, that is like pure life, pure energy, pure love. Now, in the ceremony of the deified heart, the goal was to be reborn. They considered you as a vagrant on this earth. You were just a uh, vagrant on the earth until you discovered why you were born. The important day was the day you were born when your spirit as air was breathed into you and your spirit came into you as air. Mm. And now you're having this new rebirth like with Quetzalcoatl. And it's like you can walk right into him or have him envelop you. And it's just like, uh, it's so many uh, flashing uh, rainbow facets, but as you move in, it just comes one light, one white diamond. And that's when, even if you have a person there that's not, in the ceremony, I mean, this would be amazing. It looks like fl- lights are coming out of the person's eye that has taken the mushroom this way, and the whole body is glistening and the face flowing. The Aztecs say your soul will now be implanted on your face, you know, that you'll have your soul life expressed in your face. face. And this is the moment when a brief time with the male-female that death is overcome. You're there in pure life, and you're there in pure life with and it's all based on love because your body has to feel real good. I mean, there's a body intelligence in this body intelligence is saying, wow, this is beautiful uh, because the flesh wants to feel good and you feel loud like you're never before. And I know a lot of healers and people, they'll have a person in the ceremony and Quetzalcoatl just comes and swallows them. There was a guy with us in Utah that had been in a motorcycle accident and was all messed up from it and it was unbelievable it was like Quetzalcoatl swallowed him it was like he was actually moving through this rainbow jeweled snake you know coming out to be re-killed and uh, I know it's so weird after it's over uh, everybody <laughs> feels the next day like they're 10 years younger you know I know it healed my knee I've been blowing my knee out for hiking the Appalachian Trail and I had an ankle I'd ruptured from running around the swamps in Florida and they're both really healed now, but you, you realize what this is, is a pure, pure, pure force of love mm. at that moment in time when it's over becoming old death and ever, everything. That's when you're in sort of Kairos time. You've obliterated the concept of time, but that whole key is slowly masticating the mushrooms, never swallowing. And so would somebody, just spit that out eventually or how no no it all goes in oh, okay so if we're talking about live mushrooms not dried mushrooms okay i can do it with dried mushrooms but when you put those mushrooms that you've been saying you pick them two at a time why two at a time I, why yeah is there a reason behind that well it sort of represents the male and female and i goes eat my my brujo even used to show me some that looked like sort of male and female sexual organs to try to look for that. But I think that was more of a respect or mythology or to look deeper, you know. But the thing he really beat in my head was don't take this like you're running around out in the jungle like some idiot like Indiana Jones looking for something, having a tent. Right. Know what the reason but don't get hung up on it because every time I had a reason why I was doing this that didn't come out to be but I realized I was going with where the sacred mushroom where Quetzalcoatl was taking me and all the people in this world are your friends you know they're, they're all your friends and they're all these angels there and other things to help you but in this ceremony these the saliva has palatin enzymes and with the honey they hydrolyze the sacrament and that sounds all sapphic, but that's why the Aztecs call it the holy flowers of the blood. Hmm. And they were, they're absorbed in your facial brains, inside, veins inside your mouth, and through your mouth's mucous membranes. This allows unbelievably rapid absorption directly into your bloodstream by 
what we call buccal or subliminal administration. You know, sort of like people want to get an aspirin to go fast. They leave it on their tongue, right? Yeah. Hmm. And if you go ahead and carry your hair egg fast, don't swallow the aspirin. Leave it on your tongue or swish it around with water. But see, all that psilocybin is converted 100% to psilocin, and the glucose is going directly into the bloodstream. These subepilethal cal- facial capillaries are taking it directly to the heart, and your mouth is taking it directly to your spine and to your brain. And I believe that Quetzalcoatl found this ceremony. He created this ceremony to bring about this living serpent for healing and for sort of like meeting the pure love and the pure perfect male-female energy of the cosmos of the hand of creation. But then, you know, after he died, his followers all started calling the ceremony, the ceremony to meet Quetzalcoatl because once you have participated in this ceremony, you gained the right to be called Quetzalcoatl, and the people in this ceremony then would be calling each other Quetzalcoatl because they had experienced the mushroom in this sacred way hmm. as a sacred sacrificial meal. Yeah, really interesting. Um, yeah, and that's interesting about like the metabolism conversion. I don't know too much about that, but that's something I'm definitely gonna have to look into. Um, but I know, you know, glucose is one of those things that is able to enter into the blood brain barrier. It's kind of like food for the brain. So yeah, it's it's really interesting. Um, well, honey, I've raised honeybees. Honeybees are so good. You could put them on your honey on your skin, and it'll go into you. Honey is the purest food in the world. It doesn't even need to be digested. Right. Hmm. And so you're taking that, combine it with the saliva that's doing the conversion and just slowly, slowly, slowly eating. And all of a sudden it's just like, you feel like you're disappearing except for your teeth. (laughs) Right. And you said this ceremony is during the day, typically? At night. Oh, at night. Okay. I thought you said something about doing this during the day. Because I was going to say, no, isn't I, most... I said it is really good to learn about the sacred mushroom to have ceremonies during the day. I particularly like ceremonies high in the mountains and clouds when thunderstorms are going on oh. and lightning is going on. They, they, you can, there's stuff that you can see that's just unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. That that makes sense. Because I... I yeah, no, traditionally, aren't these ceremonies usually done at night? So when you said something about the daytime, I was like, oh, that's the first I've heard that. <laughs> well, there's actually, you know, in the human eye, there are bile photons. And so when I'm telling you about the light shining out of your eyes, that's a real thing because they realize that light is shining, not only coming into your eyes, but shining out. If you ever want to believe me, just go to a pond near my house where a photographer, a friend of mine, takes the pictures of alligator eyes at night in that pond with a special camera. You can see how the lights light up and send the light out from inside. So how did you uh, end up learning about this? Uh, I'm guessing your time in Mexico, but yeah, I'm I'm really curious on how you ended up uh, learning about this ceremony. Well, it came to me when I had been down in Zipolete and we had a time, we were living down there and people were taking mushrooms. And in my book, I describe a lot of different experiences that led me to going up the mountains. One of the strangest was I was with a guy, Bill from California, who after I'd been to Walter, this was before San Maria Sabina, wanted to go to Zipolete. And it was pretty well known that you could get mushrooms in uh, San Jose de Pacifica because Oaxaca, the police sort of watched out for that and you didn't want to do it when you were down in the city of Oaxaca. But coming up on the mountains and we came down to Zipolete and it was at night and uh, we decided to do the sacred mushrooms and walk along the beach. And I don't know, did you read that story in my book? No, I didn't get to it. Well, for some reason, we decided to walk around the beach because we didn't usually do that. And when we were, uh, it was nightfall, and it, 
we had taken quite a few mushrooms and we just wanted to talk. He was leaving and I was staying and we came around the bend and there was this uh, small Mexican village with a church and a little tienda and we were talking about the different people and usually people pull tables out and invite you to eat with them or you pay a little money for eating with them but we were deciding whether we'd go through the town or not and how friendly the people were and everything and we were going right into this town talking about them and then everybody just disappeared totally 100 percent disappeared now that made me realize something was going on we were both overwhelmed by this experience because we were talking about the same people and we were talking about that little Catholic church and the tienda and the family and we were talking about the fire we had and all of a sudden, you know, nothing's there. Now, I can't tell you what all that meant. It's way over my pay grade. <laughs> but you, that was one of my first experiences, you know? Right. Was, did that town exist or did, you, you're, you're saying it just, it all kind of disappeared? It was... It disappeared. It was at night. You know, the sun had just set. It was a little past the afterglow. And I don't know why we had this sort of same sort of... I've heard other people told me they've done it with other people, too, where you see the same thing, you know, at the same time. And, you know, but what was so weird about us, we were talking about it and describing different people, different places. And I'm thank goodness I was thinking good thoughts and good thoughts because, you know, I mean, here I am thinking all these thoughts and what are these people like and they don't even exist. You know what I mean? Yeah. Really interesting. And, and we'd seen the same thing. And and so we lived down in Zipalete with the Indians and the fishermen down there. It was a really isolated place, way away from the road. There, no, no regular tourist ever came there. There were some Europeans that came there from around Europe that knew about that place and were painters or making music or taking some of the ethogens. Uh, and some of them bought some Tibetan temple balls, which were really great. And then we had all sorts of people you know, avoiding the law, people that had been arrested in California for pot or something like that, or people that didn't want to be in the draft or just people hiding out from the law in the States. And at that time, Nixon had a reward. So but this part of the world, the federalities never came in, but they had these people down there who were called the healers. There were some people from the, I think the big Sur area, somewhere in California. And they were, some of them had been previous medics in the army and they were helping the Indians, you know, with natural means, whatever was the current or the people were into back then, you know, in California and the seventies, you know, and, they weren't charging them anything, but they made a big mistake. They told the fishermen about the fishermen in Acapulco were going to try to take over a lot of their business and take over a lot of their trade. They were way up north past Escondido, but the whole state of Oaxaca was actually really run by the money interest in Acapulco that the, the government and, and even though it might have been the capital, the big shots were in Acapulco, if you know what I mean, and the big fishermen that made money. And so we were there one day, and they, the dealers were around, and all of a sudden, here come all these federal rallies with trucks in town to export all these people and take them out and take them back to America. They were gone in three days. Hmm. And... uh we saw when they came down and saw us and everything that, you know, they wanted to take us back because it was like money, $50 a pop for America. And then you'd have to pay that or you'd get out of jail and the next jail would be a hundred. And then you'd go from a county to a city. And some of them came in, but we were with the Indians. And one of my strangest experiences, I was there with, was the only black guy within 200 miles or maybe where we were, it was Tony Burton was his name. He was in the room. And we had these mushrooms for a ceremony that night with these two Swiss people. And uh, two other people, and it's like, he said, Tom, you got to get rid of these. The federal officers are coming into this little tent. you got to get rid of them. Oh, gosh. Do something with them. And so I looked at him, and I was all freaked out, you know, being a former altar boy in the Episcopal Church and everything. I, 
you know, I can't throw out a sacrament. I can't throw it away. You know, I can't throw it on the ground. You know what I mean? You know, you can't spill a sacrament if you, if you really consider it a sacrament. So I just ate them all. It was crazy, but I ate every one of them. That way I figured they were safe and I hit them drunk. <laughs> it's sort of stupid. You know, I wasn't doing a lot of deep thinking. Right. But they came into the room and it was just sort of weird. And they saw us and they were going to like take us. And it was all of a sudden the whole vibe in the room were like, we're going to take you. Don't even think about it. You know, like you might get one or two of us, but we'll get you. And they would all come back later without their government uniforms and make more money for themselves anyway, you know, and so they left. And one of the strangest stories, that's when Tony and the French Canadian guy, Charles, I was with and Lowe and this girl, Lori from California, we decided to get out of there because we were afraid that, you know, that the federales were going to come back and get us. So we were going to go way up in the mountains to a place Charles had heard about. It actually been where Roger Heim had been with Watson hmm. in San Augustine, La Cicha. But there was the strangest story. So we're walking up a road next to the beach, and you realize that the dirt roads there are just cut out of the mountainside. You understand what I'm saying? Of the dirt hills. You follow what I'm saying? Yep. And one of the most strangest events, I was there walking with them, and we were headed north, and all of a sudden this beat-up old truck pickup truck with a Mexican driving it, and two children sitting between them and one child on the lap of this lady that was on the outside and they were going who knows where. And all of a sudden I took off running and ran and jumped and landed in the pickup with his going. I was only going three or four miles an hour. So don't make a big deal of it. Okay. It wasn't going fast because that road was too bumpy. It tore it up and I only had to jump down about six feet to land in the bed. And I leaned into the woman where the woman was in this uh, car, and I told her, I said, don't go back to your house. I said, don't go, out, go to your place, your hacienda, where you live. I said, the federales are all around. And I jumped out and ran back up the mountain. I mean, not the mountain, but the slope of the berm and got with Tony. And then we proceeded to San Augustine to see her. But later, two months later, I saw her in a little market in Pachuca, and she came up and she hugged me in the you know, I bought her a cerveza, and, and, and she and her husband there, she said, we couldn't believe it. You were the craziest gringo we'd ever seen in our life. She said, your eyes were the wildest, craziest-looking eyes we'd ever seen. <laughs> but, we, but we drove up to the ledge where it overlooked our hacienda because it was a high park. I told my husband to stop, and he went over and looked because it, it, it was just pull, up, just pull out and go look through these trees. And the whole house was surrounded by federales, so they just – she said, we turned around and went back to our family in Oaxaca and waited a couple of weeks. I just think they were there to scare them and intimidate them. They weren't going to do anything more than probably just beat them up a little bit, you know, and let them know that don't get involved in politics, you know? Right. I'm sure they appreciated that uh, warning. <laughs> well, I'm just glad I saw her again, and she told me that because I felt I was somewhat of a nutcase jumping off of this whole thing. <laughs> I just started running for no reason at all and just jumped. And I looked in, and I think possibly I knew the Federales were all around looking for people, and they'd gone that way. And you'd seen a bunch of them going that way, so it wasn't that far beyond imagination that they would. Right, so you didn't know. It was just more like an intuitive feeling. Yeah, but it was like something inside me spoke. I mean, you know, a lot of people talk about when you take the mushroom, there's something that comes up in you, speaks it. You speak without thinking, you know? Yeah. That's why uh, pure love and pure physical love between a person is so important, a man and a woman on the mushroom, because it's a, it's a sacrament, and it's a sacrament where it's sort of like, you know, MDMA in a way, like, you know, you wouldn't have sex or a relationship with somebody if you didn't love them. You know, it's not like a possession sort of gub or you're going to get somebody to do something against their will, like, you know, maybe cocaine or some of this other stuff people take. But this is, you know, it was, I think it came from within me and it was like the mushroom speaking to me, but I was so glad it turned out good for her and the family, you know, you know, that nothing happened. Otherwise they just was going driven around right up to their hacienda. Right. Hmm. So and that's when we want to go ahead. Oh no, no, this was going to be a little off topic. So you can finish the story quickly. 
No, that's pretty. We went up, and the most eventful things that happened were in the graveyard of San Augustine La Cicha. Mm. And what happened in the graveyard up there in the mountains up in the clouds, and then later over in uh, off the mountains, I lived in a pasture away from where anybody came except two shepherds. Mm. And the second time I w- went to Walt, I didn't even want to go because I knew it was covered with federales and army. But a couple of people wanted to go, and it's the craziest thing. I threw the I Ching twice. First time I threw it, I told the guy I didn't believe it. And I hadn't thrown the I Ching. It's the only book I had with me besides Tony Sherrill's book, The Lord of the Dawn. And even the changing lines came up again. And so that's when we went. Um, met my wife there, who I'm still married to today. We were married two weeks after that ceremony. That's when she decided it was time for me to come back to the States, you know? <laughs> Getting a little too weird and wild. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you you spent a little bit of time with Maria Sabina, is that correct? Yeah, it's... Uh, when we went there to see her, by this time I knew about Maria Sabina, you know? It wasn't like the first time when I didn't know anything about her and I was with a different... Daryl, this time I knew about her, and it was like going to see the Pope in Rome, you know, as far right. as I was concerned, you know, going to the pearly gates. So we went to Walt, uh, this is 73, and Shirley had gotten lost with this uh, friend of hers who was a botanist who later worked at Harvard and other places. And anyway, we were there in the town, and I saw him outside, and I told him, I said, You can't be out in this town, you've got to hide. We had this letter from this guy whose son of a high ranking official in Mexico that gave us the right to be in Walla for about two or three days. He said, I don't know how much I believe that, but I stayed out of sight with Kendas. And so that day, that very, very early morning, we all decided to go up to see Maria Sabina. And when sometimes when you're going through Walla, it's just unbelievable. It's like you're in the middle of a cloud when it's raining. You can be in a street and have, be perfectly dry, and minutes later, you're up to your ankles in water, or you're just moving through these clouds, you know, constantly with fog and mist. And finally, our little group, we made it up to see Maria Sabina, and her daughter Apollonia was there. And there was one of her Apollonia sons that could translate uh, Spanish to the Maztec. And so... She agreed to do a ceremony that night, and everybody wanted to leave and go back down and come later that night. But I asked her, I said, you know, I'd really like to just sit here during the day, and I'd just like to sit here in the house and uh, sit calmly here, you know. Uh, And she said, yeah, that's that's fine. And Shirley, who was with me, or Shelly at the time, she sat there too, so... It was like I spent the whole day in her house, and it's incredible. It's like, you know, there's no windows or doors. You you understand these houses are not like the day they had thatched roofs and adobe, but there was no windows or doors. You understand that? Mm. Silver hangs. And sometimes clouds would come through the house. And I remember one time, most incredible thing, she had and her daughter had given me and Shirley some cocoa to drink. And I really appreciated that. And I was sitting there, and there was this chip chicken come along the, and all of a sudden a bolt of lightning went in one wind and out the other. I mean, we were in a cloud, but that didn't somehow that didn't seem unusual to me at all. It just seemed like I've been living in the mountains and clouds so much that it was just normal, but her feet seemed to be like grown into the ground. I mean, I'd seen we old Indians and I'd seen Indians in Mexico, some places. And I swear I used to swear, oh my God, their 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 feet is the same color as the soil. These people grew out. Seems so many didn't have shoes, you know, or just little pieces of tires or leather. They didn't have shoes, and and their feet on the ground, especially when it was rainy, looked like somehow they'd grown out of the earth. And her presence there, she was just so really, really, really calm and and very present. And it was something the next day she did for us that was really quite unbelievable that I, one years later that I found out about, like, 
that ne- ceremony at night, uh, Shelley and myself, we felt like we had found each other after millions of years of reincarnations of something, not our egos or anything, but some something there. I don't know what it was. But when we were leaving that day, we were we had decided to go back together. And she knew we were going to go through the federales. And Apollonia came up and said, look, my mom wanted to give this to you and to Shirley. And uh, she says, it'll get you through the Army and the Federales without any problem. And I didn't know what it was. I'd never heard of it. They looked like walnuts, but they were like the Tarosha, or I guess the closest, if somebody's listening to this, would be like a truffle. Mm. And she said her mom could see them growing under the earth. She could, she because they were where the lightning hit, and she could see them actually growing. And she wanted us to have them and help us get back through. I just thought that was really nice. And actually, I took that all the way back through customs. They completely tore my car apart when I got when I when I got there. That I was getting back. We we're going back in Shirley's car, and it was unbelievable, you know. Uh, but. They had no idea what they were. It just looked like a walnut to them. Huh, interesting. That's that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, and it was, uh, but she had an unbelievable presence. Like in the start of the ceremony, she made a real effort to learn your name. Mm. And I mean, you would pronounce it and she would pronounce it again. It might be three or four times. And I'll tell you, the, like the, when you, you finally said this right, it almost seemed to come like ventriloquy out of the walls. It was almost like she was saying your name just like you were saying it. It was, it was like it was a, you were disembodied saying your name. You know what I mean? Hmm. Yeah, I think so. Well, I mean, it was like she really learned to say your name perfectly because she was going to go to the altar hmm. and offer blessings oh, for right. you. Like during the ceremony, you would hear her your name and... It would sound like you said it. I mean, it was exactly like you had said it. You know, I'm a hillbilly. You can tell my hillbilly accent. Well, she mastered that. (laughs) Well, anyway, it's just like she gave us all mushrooms, and she made a point that we all eat them together. It's really important that her daughter and everything, all got to all eat them together in this circle, you know, and do the mushrooms. And then she rubbed tobacco from right above my hand where my wrist is, she rubbed the back of the end of my arm going all the way up the inside of both arms. And that's pretty common sometimes for night shades to be used like that. That's the only way they should be used. People are insane to take the back of teas and the back of drapes with all the stuff that got in them. But that sort of is to like loosen your etheric or loosen your body up hmm. to loosen up your, uh, so you can, it's in a way some people can actually leave their body. It's much easier for some people than it does to others. But, and then when you do the ceremony at night, uh, your body will start to resonate cause your own a rug on a dirt floor. And all of a sudden you'll feel, almost feel like she's, chanting and she's resonating and she's causing the earth to resonate and you're resonating and there's this all this resonation and they call her a sabio now you know in mexico there's curanderos and curanderos and brujos and brujas the brujos and bajas aren't like we think of a bad witch or anything they're just sort of anti-social people but and curanderos and curanderos usually have a great affinity that one of the effigies has picked them. That's the most insane thing that people think they're going to become a shaman or something because these effigies choose people to have the opportunity, whether you accept it or not, you know, for this. And so you have this great knowledge, but she was considered from as a young girl, she, her, her job was guarding the chickens with a stick hmm. to keep the uh, pops from getting them. And so she was around these mushrooms in the field and she had been in ceremonies, but the, the people said she had sent in the hand of creation. She had actually had unbelievable wisdom, you know, that this wisdom, this great unbelievable wisdom that she had 
was sort of like, I don't know, maybe Kesquiquall had that or some, some people, but she had that musical, poetic, ventriloquy. Uh, she was a midwife. People forget that, you know? Mm. And uh, she was sort of like, you know, every day you got to realize for these Indians, a matter of getting food and stuff. It's not like, oh, okay, we got it in the grocery. And there, there wasn't even any refrigeration, you know? Right. And so you're really in touch with the earth. You're in real touch with the earth, you know, because you don't want to make mistakes when you're living on the earth from, the, from a lot of different standpoints, but she stood at the very, her place was very much in the high mountains up there in the clouds. And I'm pretty sure it's so hot, hard to grow corn on that slope. And she, she still did all that stuff, but she was a very strong woman. And at that time, you know, the federales and the uh, army had sort of sealed off what was, from people coming up there. So I felt like I was back in the time before, you know, a lot of people describe it as almost being back in Neanderthal times as far as, you know, no electricity, no paved roads, no radios, no TVs, no refrigeration, no plastic anywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. It was real, real world. And uh, it was just the most incredible ceremony that night. Uh, David, in my book, he put down what happened to him as his experiences in the ceremony and the healing experiences. My wife, Shelly, she doesn't want to write down what all of what she saw and learned. She just doesn't want to uh, write it down. To me, I try to do it as best I could. From my own experience, a lot of these things are so mystical, integrated with what I feel like is Quetzalcoatl and the people in that world that are trying to reverse what's happening in this world, you know, mm. today. I mean, the difference between dwelling people and the technological silicon silicone carbon people we're becoming, you know? Right. Yeah. Oh, that must have been a really cool experience to be able to sit in ceremony with her. I mean, that's a, that seems like a huge honor. <laughs> I know I probably would have been feeling pretty honored and blessed to be able to sit with her in, in ceremony. And then you also, did you get to spend time with uh, Gordon Watson or you just had a little bit of access to his archive at, at some point? Well, the first time I went to 78 to a meeting in San Francisco, where it's actually mentioned in Storm in Heaven, and I, I wish they'd mention my name. It was just, I'm just kidding, because they said all the usual suspects were there. But I think Jonathan Ott had put it on, and that's when I met Schultes and Hoffman and got to talk to them and had them sign my books, because I had some really incredible books by them, and especially on the physiology. And uh, I met Watson there, and that's when he was introducing Ojibwe, the lady from the Northwest, and I could talk to you later about why that never came out, even though I had all these tapes and stuff of it. I mean, there were cassettes made, but he decided into 2026 for that book or information to be released, and I saw about a lot of it in the archives, but and I know what a lot of it's about, but it just, in 2026, it'll get released, but when I met Watson there, one of the first things I was he was along with uh, Hoffman and Schultes, and I guess me being just a dumb hillbilly, I just come up and start talking to him and and asking them what the hell they thought about this Carlos Castaneda. You know, I mean, here's this crazy hillbilly asking, what do you think about this character and everything, you know, because I've been down there and I'd seen his books when I came back. And Watson laughingly said, uh, Castaneda is not real, but Don Juan is. And Hoffman and Schultes, both to the affirmative, made comments that that was true. And later on, uh, I had some correspondence, some letters and forth, back and forth with Watson. And uh, I used to train a lot of people in solar energy. In fact, I'm one of only 25 people in the World Solar Hall of Fame. And I was put in for all my training manuals. But Back during the 80s, 
I knew I was going to be in Connecticut. So I arranged two things. One, to be able to go see him and spend a, a two days and a night with him and uh, to uh, bring him some books I had to look at and some of the stuff I'd written down and also to be up there when the trees were changing, you know. It's nice up there when in the fall. Yeah, it's like where I was born and raised in the mountains of Tennessee, you know, where the leaves change. They're beautiful out there. And so I, he was unbelievably gracious. I mean, his, uh, I can't remember, the lady there was sort of like his helper taking care of him, but he had this big, incredible open porch area that went out into a garden. And uh, I talked to him for a while, and I told him my story about meeting Quetzalcoatl and the ceremony and everything. And I was thinking maybe he would think I was off my rocker and <laughs> have her hustle me to the door. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, he agreed that he thought there was a lot that to that, that there was all this to be found. I mean, he had just barely touched on some of this stuff. And, I, you know, the guy with Carl DeBerge with the mushroom stones and all of this stuff was starting to come out and sort of be above ground. But it wasn't until later to people, you know, it wasn't even the 61 when the Stellas of Stachymilisco were discovered. Uh, six years after Watson, they were found buried and broken up. And uh, what are uh, those? Or what well, is that? Uh, the three Stellas of Stachymilisco were in the highest Aztec temple they were four basalt statues about 55 inches tall, about 16 inches on one side and nine inches on the other. And these three had the carved whole initiation of the sacred mushroom, a lot in them. Now, in my book, I have some pictures of them. I'm going to go down to the museum again to take some really good pictures. But uh, Jose Padilla in his book, on Quetzalcoatl with Dimitri Soda just gives an incredible description of everything and of what these are. And basically the Spanish, when they broke them into three pieces and painted them red, that was a symbolic way of killing them and burying them. They were discovered in 63. Well, these three statues go through the sacred journey of Quetzalcoatl into the underworld. And there's the whole rugs, there's the ceremonial center, there's the uh, ceremonial center at Tiwatuacan, and all these things are carved into these four-sided stellas on the three of them. And I didn't even introduce that to the forward of my, I mean, to the addendum of my book, the last 28 pages, because I felt like uh, this information was uh, a little bit too heavy for most people to handle that the uh, normies or normal people could read the first 280 pages and the last 28 would have about these sacred uh, stellas and what the meanings of them are. And also the Codex Vienna has also got uh, it's page 24. It shows the whole ceremony there with Pollock and uh, Quetzalcoatl and Xochipilli and taking of the sacred mushrooms and how the bee is done with honey and the, and the whole story of this uh, sacred ceremony, the deified heart. But, you know, people are starting to find out about these now, and there's so many of these motifs and so many of these uh, codexes that were destroyed. But, you know, they had these mushroom ceremonies all over them. Of course, you know, the Spanish weren't exactly too excited to find out that all their ceremonies have been somewhat copied by the Aztecs, you know, like he gets a quote over when they asked him to make a physical symbol. He said, I don't want to make a physical symbol. He said, well, make something. He said, okay, I'm going to make you a tree. One arm stretched out to pain, the other to love the whole world. God gave us love and pain. And it's what makes the world go down around. And we have to experience the pain in our life. You know, just like I lost a really good childhood friend the other day, you've got to experience that pain, but, but find the love and the gratitude and everything for knowing that person. And you've got to be able to celebrate the pain, too. 
And then the third thing Quetzalcoatl said that God gave mankind was knowledge, but it's just like, you know, the whole Adam and Eve thing. He didn't like that too much, not because it made us smart, but he said My knowledge makes a lot of men arrogant, that they think they're some uh, something special, you know, or something arrogant over other people because of the knowledge they gained. Mm -hmm. And this knowledge of the sacred mushroom is interesting. There's a story that's told that's sort of about getting the knowledge of the, of the sacred mushroom and learning it, you know, is a story told to the young priest. And it's uh, about a beggar, this beggar, or what they call a rag picker finds this box and it has all sorts of, uh, jewels of divination in it, and it has cures to cure people, and it has things to heal people with, and it has things to, you know, all sorts of create things like this. And he takes it to a mushroom priest, and he says, show it to me, show it to me how to work, make it work. And the priest basically tells him, well, you have to do these ceremonies, and you have to take it, and he gets upset because it isn't just immediate, you know? Mm -hmm. So he's going to kill the priest. And, of course, in this story, all sorts of deities come out of the plants, the earth, the trees, the water, and tear the rag picker apart, you know, before he can do any harm to the priest. But the, basically the story is there is that this is a uh, Quetzalcoatl comes into the world to experience the living life force of love and healing powers on this earth. But we have to be ready by intent to want to meet him and, and to meet Quetzalcoatl. And so that's part of the ceremony. It's not just like putting another notch on your effigy gun. These are people that are dedicated to this experience. And I guess you can say if there's nothing in there, three weeks ago in the desert in Utah, there's a bunch of followers or higher fans that all experienced meeting the jewel plume serpent. You know, we took it in ceremony at the same time. And that's one of the things I want to let people know is about how to take the sacred mushrooms to actually meet and become and have Quetzalcoatl healing you. Yeah, and that's all it, in your book. I know you said you, the, the book is kind of like a guidebook. For... I just told you in the podcast. I mean, right, this isn't right, some yeah. very but, but it's... This isn't some great guru up on a ledge sitting under a blanket on a mountaintop. I mean... This is a way of taking the sacred mushrooms when they're alive, when they are living. And you're fasted and taking cocoa and sung to the mushroom, but basically by eating the mushrooms this way, everything is going straight to your spine and to your brain and right to your heart. And this is not some mystical UFO weird people in the middle of the earth. This is a physiological fact of what happens when you take them this way. And you just keep eating. Like I said, this is beyond dosage that you're going to the place and then Quetzalcoatl will come. And it's, it's the most wonderful thing in the world to actually see the jeweled wing plumed serpent that everybody was talking about. The rainbow serpent, you know, the female male Whatever it is, you know, it, 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 it comes in love and peace. And to kill you, your body will just feel unbelievable, you know, after that. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's a, I don't know. It's, you know, I waited, waited over 44 years to write about a lot of this and everything. And then my, one of my sons told me to do more than four books, you know, or five books that other people would want to know about this. But sometimes, you know, when I look on, people told me, well, go look on YouTube at some of these people and what they're doing today. And there's a lot of well-meaning people. But a lot of them don't know about how to do these certain particular ceremonies, you know. And part of it is, the most important thing, is realizing it's a sacrament. Mm. You have to feel about it the same way as you'd feel something has to be sacred to you in your life. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, there must be something sacred to you. I guess sometimes we can have a sacred relationship. I have one to my uh, big Labrador 
you know, dog. I mean, we have a relationship, but the, the mushroom is relationship to the earth. It's the earth, the divine feminine in the earth. And this is a male going into that and arising out of death. And something's in there with our DNA that I realize that you can, that you can experience. And that's why I see the people that are like followers to see this as a religion. I mean, it blows my mind that people are having ayahuasca religions or churches here in Florida. This, these mushroom ceremonies is, is a religious ceremony, a ceremony of experience, not inside walls, not inside castles, not inside a priest telling you what to do, but in at these sacred spots, you know, uh, will educate you. You know, they'll it really educate you, educate you that to get, get rid of your ego pretty quick because then you can get rid of fear. Once you get rid of the ego, you can't fear anything. You, you understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And then all there is, it's ability to love things. And one of the things I was going to tell you about Quetzalcoatl, that there's some of the people that do a sacred mushroom trip, it's everybody can go to the land of the, tree of life and into the Lord of the Dawn. But there's also people that are too curious that take what's called the trip in the hell. They go into the underworld. They experience Quetzalcoatl's journey into the underworld. You follow what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And you go to a place like with me, it was like every tree branch, every leaf had a rattlesnake on its head trying to bite me and the roots of trees were rats trying to eat me. And then it just dawned on me as I have an epiphany. Well, I guess I made it couldn't be any worse than that. And then it was like, uh, I had a feeling of Quetzalcoatl or Christ or white life here. And I said, how the hell do I get out of here? And it was like, just love everything. Just love it all. And then immediately the rats went back to being tree roots and the leaves quit being rattlesnakes trying to bite me. And all the other things were happening. And for some people, they experience that when Quetzalcoatl comes the first time and her feet only the first time, not afterwards. He comes as a huge black dra- dragon dripping blood with bloody black blood from his teeth and skulls around his belt. And your reaction to this is, that's fantastic. Uh, eat me and I'm going to turn you into love. I feel so much love. I feel so much love for you. When you eat me, you'll change for all of humanity. And of course, Immediately, he changes to the jeweled wing, blue serpent. Then, mm. and, and you never have to see the dragon again. Only some people do that, but it's to make you realize the only way you can overcome hatred and fear is with love. Right. You know, it's an important message. And, uh, yeah, and to me, it's there's three parts of your body. There's your conscious mind. Your unconscious mind, which is like that huge part of the iceberg below, and your living body, which is intelligent to have flesh, and that's why your heart actually has a flesh, and it's living and intelligent with the rest of your body because the body wants to feel good, and to heal yourself with all all you have to do during this thing is just breathe a lot, just bring in a lot of breath, just breathe, breathe, breathe deeply because you're creating the oxygen to do all the healing. And, you know, the first thing you realize is when you take a sacred mushroom and I've told people this, they'll have a thought, Oh, this nasty, bad thought. And I'll tell people, don't worry about it. It's just a damn channel beforehand. I said, look, you know, when you came into this world, you were blank slate, except for your epigenetic DNA and all those archetypes you brought with me. But, but now you got all this stuff and you learn to listen to good stuff and bad stuff and just quit listening to the good stuff bad stuff, you know, because having a good thought will make you feel better or follow your breath. And it's so easy to see why people are being healed on the mushroom because when you make the three connections, when you connect the the unconscious, the conscious, and the living, alive, intelligent body in that three-way connection, they're all talking to each other. That's Mm. why the body is saying, look, I want to feel good. I like feeling good. I like pleasurable feelings. So let's get this negative thought out or you're you're dislike somebody for all these years, you know, get it out of the body, get it away, you know, so that it's a body that's 
teaching the mind and the mind at the same time is saying, okay, instead of thinking this uh, violent thought or this uh, hateful thought or whatever you want to call it, if I focus on a thought of peace, if I focus on something good, it's healing my mind and my body's being healed and it's all happening at the same time. And it's all related to breath because right. your breath is just simply your spirit. And all you got to do is breathe deeply up and down your spine. I don't know these crazy people who want to stop their breath or pass out. No, you want to pump a lot of oxygen in there because the oxygen is going to make you feel good. And when you stop it for moments against your spine, you can feel your body healing itself. This is not, some magical mystical trip i mean people like maria sabina yeah she's a great healer i've known Turanderos like francisco ramides and alisela rodriguez the great Turanderos. and but uh the mushroom has the ability it's not necessarily going to give you the opportunity or the choose to be a Curandero or, or, you know, a Curandero or something like that, but, but you're always going to have the ability to use it to improve your life and heal yourself and make you feel better. I mean, that's why I say during the day, sometimes when I'm taking it, I've woken up and it's almost like I did it with this Buddhist monk and it was like I've woken up from a grave. All of a sudden, all my arms moving, I can see my flesh moving in my arm and like, when I think good thoughts, it's all bright and glowing and happy, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you're just training yourself. Your body is teaching the mind. The mind. It's, it's really that simple. The body is teaching the mind. And that's what the sacred mushroom does. And that's why a lot of people are scared of it because they're afraid of it for a lot, a lot of reasons. You know, people, they're sort of three ghosts. They're afraid of their own mind, they're afraid of death and the ego, or they're afraid of other people. You know, well, when you figure you got nothing left to lose but your mind, then that's not much. You know, like with me, I didn't have much to lose. <laughs> I like that I just perspective. Wanted to find pure love, you know. Yeah, I like I just that. Want to find pure love. I like that perspective of the body's teaching the mind. I mean, I just think about like physiologically like our body's always sending us signals and i'm thinking about like some trauma uh theory is like you know some of these signals are firing our bodies telling us things which then can convert into to emotions right and we're not always aware of what our body's telling us even though it's playing a huge role in the emotions and our breathing definitely affects that in in different ways um you know constricted breathing uh you know it's really kind of uh, starting to maybe feel a little bit depressed or anxious, but when we can really open up and breathe deeper, maybe we feel a little bit different. But um, Tom, I just, I, I really want to thank you for your time. And uh, any last thoughts? We're well over an hour. I just been having a really fun time listening uh, to your story and, and thanks for sharing it with all the listeners here. It's been really interesting to learn about Quetzalcoatl. But um, any last like words or anything that you want to throw out there? And um, if you have an online presence Presence or where can people find your book? So, yeah, just any last way to wrap well, this up. Well, it's mainly at Amazon. You know, it's on Kindle at Amazon. I'm not good at marketing. I'm just getting this stuff done, and they can go, and it's a 308-page, huge, 8 and a half by 11 with unbelievable artwork in it. And uh, I'm sort of a nutcase. I, I paid the last of my savings, about $10,000, to do all the artwork and design work in my book. I'm somewhat of a nut like Watson and having a good book, you know. It's good. And then I'll put my Kindle Kindle book out. And um, the main thing I say is like there's there's going to be three types of people. If you just want to go to raids and party and have a good time, there's nothing wrong with that. I won't poop on anybody's party. And I'm not against the pharmacological use of the sacred mushrooms. If you want to lay back in a couch with somebody, if somebody put shades on your head and listen to Mozart. But I know from the reality of what I call the six senses, like intuition, like uh, what I'm talking about, ESP, clairvoyance, divination, all of these six senses, we don't have to go into them. 
But those are sort of natural things, you know, that occur. You understand what I'm saying? Especially to our ancestors who were primitive people that we had to know where the jaguar was or the deer were. We had to be able to feel. Right. Well, what I'm telling people, when these sort of things are going to start happening to you on the sacred mushroom, for one thing, don't talk till the ceremonies are over. Just try to not talk. Uh, but listen, so you can get all the synchronicity, all the young, all the, you know, the crow flies, the, the uh, frog makes a croak, uh, a shooting star happens, and you're getting all that synchronicity. But more than that, when you get these two intuition things, I call it like going down the road, and you're going to find yourself on a bicycle all of a sudden, right? But don't look at the bicycle. Don't look at the gears. These are just tools. Quit, get over that you might be astral traveling or get over that you might have clairvoyance or get over that all these things are happening. All of a sudden, look at that. What's that? What's going on? No, they're just tools. Use them while they're there and don't pay attention to them or you're going to run into the signpost. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You and, used and this analogy a while ago. And I, I really like that one. Yeah, that's good. Because all of these things are going to come, synthanasia, all sorts of things, and some to other people than others. Certain people have special gifts that certain things will come. I'll tell you one of the biggest thing I think is going to athletes because uh, it enables you to perfectly tune the body for running. Uh, like you can run, 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 and never get hot, and just uh, your breathing is just in perfect synchronization. But the, the, but the main thing of it is, is you know, if you can just try to love and experience the feeling of love when you're doing the sacred mushroom, love for yourself and everybody. And you, you know, whatever, whatever happens, don't judge things. I mean, you may see a person with no hands and no legs and think there for the grace of God, go out. Well, maybe that person's some sort of a light and incredible person because of what happened to him, you know? Right. And we want to make judgments, but it's best just to try to love people and to be kind. You know, the one thing of it is it, it teaches you that acts of kindness and acts of love are what makes your body feel good and makes your mind feel good. And it's all that triangle coming together, you know, and some people like I went for a long time or only did it once or twice a year or even skipped a year. I was just taking it to tune in to see, you know, where I was at, you know? Yeah. And I'm just so amazed how people can grow them now with these four kits and stuff that's available compared to, you know, having to find them in the field or the old timey techniques of inoculation like we had back in the 70s. I mean, that was really laboratory crude compared to the blessings people have today. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And much more accessible, right? I mean, you don't need to live in special areas and yeah people have the accessibility to do that if they wish to take that risk on well i met one guy who's incredible it was at the university of florida it was just at a mushroom thing and it was special and this guy had had incredibly bad cluster headaches and he had been getting really pissed he said he said i just couldn't get rid of him and so i said the hell with these doctors i've seen six doctors nothing's worked so he started reading medical journals on it he read where these mushrooms and everything well cures cluster headaches well he lived in uh mississippi or louisiana no mississippi he went out in the field and just started eating the mushrooms and it cured his cluster headache and i asked him about he said he never came back and i asked him well what about it now how do you feel about the, that sacred sort of aspect of it that i was talking about and he said well i don't like to talk to anybody about it that's just between me and the, and the mushroom. And I said, I appreciate that because I understand that it's, it's so hard to put things into words. Uh, it's terrible language. You can't really explain things that happen, you know? A lot of times I'm trying to explain to you Quetzalcoatl, this diamond serpent coming up with the jewels, <laughs> all flashing and everything. You know, I'm sure that's forming something in your mind, but until you actually experience it, you know? Right, yeah. Yeah, it's and, hard, hard and then, to put these experiences into language. And then when you look at these stellas, the soul of Chimilico, when you look at the faces on these carvings, you'll realize that that was you inside that jaguar's mouth, inside that serpent. That's you with the bug eyes, you know, in, in, inside of the jaguar, inside of the the dragon, you know? Yeah. See, this was not the going to hell. It, it was... 
what's called going into the underworld and coming out to ascend to the sun. The, and this energy passes back and forth. And when you're in a garden during the day, you can see all this. You can see, especially if it's raining, there's energy coming from the sun and the plants are sending it back. And it's almost like their hymns going on there. The most musical religious experience I've ever felt was being in one a town like St. Augustine, La Cicia, in the middle of a cloud and a rain with just, you know, all this, everything, you know, that's all these holy beings uh, emerging from out of the, out of nature. And that's why I say, for goodness sakes, go out in a garden, go way out in the middle of the woods somewhere with somebody way away from power lines or electricity or anything, you know, and experience what it is to be like the old breed, the, the, to feel the earth, to feel the earth talking to you and to be able to see and talk to plants and don't think you're crazy, you know, because you're not. You're just in a different perception of reality for a while. Yeah. All right, Tom, we got to wrap here, but thank you so much for your time and sharing your story with us. It's been really awesome to hear your journey. And yeah, everybody go check out Tom's book on Amazon. I think it, you'll enjoy it. And if you want to yeah, learn more about his story, just yeah, go check the book out. So thanks so much, Tom. Really appreciate it. Yeah, and thanks for letting me talk to you because, you know, to me, just being able to talk to you on the phone, to be able to talk to these things is almost like a spiritual or healing sort of thing, too, because... You know, back in the 70s and 80s and 90s, you know, we had to hide all this stuff. This is all underground, you know, and you weren't, you, you didn't bring any of this stuff above ground. It's amazing what's happened to the day, you know. Yeah, you these know, platforms legal. really allow us to share our story and being able to share our stories can be really healing. So it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, and I'm sure there's other people that you'll start hearing from other people that have experienced being Quetzalcoatl. There are, believe me, there are lots of people that have experienced the rainbow plume serpent. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So, Thanks so much, Tom. God bless you. God bless you guys. And goodbye. All right. And welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Tom Lane and the sacred mushroom rituals um yeah let us know what you think uh send us an email psychedelics today email at gmail and yeah if you had any thoughts about this episode let us know really interesting um again a lot of this stuff was kind of new to me in, in some sense so i feel like there's a lot more learning to do on my end about quetzalcoatl and um, just a lot of the mushroom rituals down in um, that 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 part of the world and just yeah learning a little bit more about the history um, so yeah if you all want to support the show uh, if you like this podcast if you like this episode uh, be sure to share it around instagram facebook twitter wherever you're hanging out on social media and that would be a huge help for us uh, make sure you subscribe on itunes stitcher Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, and if you like the show, leave a review. That's super helpful for us on iTunes, especially helps with algorithm and whatnot. So we would appreciate any reviews on that end. And yeah, uh, be sure to check out any of our upcoming courses, Navigating Psychedelics Live. We have uh, a few courses, uh, one starting this summer, um, July 17th and 18th, two different courses, one's for general public, the other one is for clinicians and therapists, and then we're, we're, we're doing that again in the fall as well. We have those dates up. If you just go to psychedelicstoday.com, click online courses, you'll select the course, the five-week online or the one for uh, clinicians and therapists, and then there's a bunch of info there with the dates. Um, classes will be starting at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, for these courses, hopefully in the future we can get some more dates. I know maybe 7 p.m. Eastern time doesn't work for those folks on the West Coast or even in other parts of the world. Um, so, you know, if you do want to participate in one of the live classes and these times aren't working, let us know. Um, we would love to hear any feedback about um, time suggestions. Uh, it'd be super helpful to know where people are listening from and where everybody lives and, you know, be able to cater to different time zones and whatnot. So let us know um, if, if the East Coast times don't work for you. Um, we can definitely adjust in the future. Um, yeah, so 
We'll catch you next time on Psychedelics Today. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks so much for your support.